Hello? Okay. This um, lecture here was already given by Dr. Poss, and uh, she did a good job of that. Um, I'm just going over this because I've gotten a, a, a lot of emails from individual students um, wanting to hear kind of my perspective on things or sort of what I think is important or uh, my sort of highlight reel, so to speak. Um, and I kind of, I've been busy and didn't know if I was going to have time or not. So I didn't say, you know, one way or the other if I was going to do this or not, but um, found a little bit extra time. Um, but the big caveat here is that, so I'm going to go through this pretty quick um, with you guys and again, highlight some certain things that I think are important or I want to make sure you guys want to know. However, I don't want you guys to then neglect other parts of this lecture. So please, please, please look at all the drugs in this lecture and study the entire lecture. So again, for my testing purposes, all slides, tables, etc. in addition to anything that is, is said or that I say um, is, you know, fair game for exams. So please, um, I'm going to give you guys this overview right now, um, but please, please, please look at everything. Um, look at all the drugs, even if I skip over them and go over them pretty quickly. Um, still is fair game for the exam. So anyways, oh, and by the way, too, this is an FYI lecture or FYK for your knowledge. And so um, if you do not want to listen to this, it's not mandatory or anything. So um, feel free to skip it. Or then you can also listen to Dr. Paz's um, recording on integrity or, or listen to neither of them, whatever. As long as you guys study the information and learn it for the exam and for your rotations, I mean, I don't care how you, how you get it done. So, so, anyways, so let's jump into it. First off, basic definitions and pathophysiology. Just let you guys read through that. Same thing here. I'm not going to be pulling questions for pharmacology. This may help you, maybe help you with understand some of the mechanism actions, but then it also may help in pathophysiology. Same thing here. Do not worry about memorizing this for my exam, the cascade, so to speak, the, um, the, the clot formation cascade, whatever you want to call it. Some of these factors, though, you will see in some of the mechanism of action. And so if they come up in mechanism of action, of course, that's fair game. Um, and I do want you guys to know mechanism of action. Intrinsic pathway. Uh, this is just a little mnemonic to memorize at 810. Um, but again, don't stress too much about this for my exam. Extrinsic, same thing. Just read through it. Um, and then just note that these can be used for warfarin therapy, and we'll talk about the PTI and R a little bit later. And then this can be used uh, to monitor in heparin therapy, the PTT. So that's a dis distinct distinction. Um, not so much for testing purposes for me, but definitely something that you probably will see in ICM and or on rotation. So PTT, heparin, PTI and R for warfarin. Um, again, just basic definitions. We're going to go through these to so make sure you know what this means. So um, what these different categories are. And again, categorization is always important for my exam. So first we have the antiplatelet or aka antithrombotic um, platelet inhibitors and then the platelet receptor glycoprotein inhibitors. Aspirin, so prototypical NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So we're going to get into these a lot more in the MSK musculoskeletal module. We'll go more in depth, but they are, aspirin is one of those that falls in different, into um, a couple different categories. So it's relevant for um, a number of different specialties in medicine or, or practice settings in medicine. So it's gonna, you're going to be tested on it basically a couple times. Um, part of that is just because it is ubiquitous. You're going to see it everywhere. Um, and then it, you know, it's important to know that you know, depending on what you're trying to treat, there's some rationale on when it should be used. Um, but so it's, it's for pain. It's analgesic, antipyretic, which means it, it's a fever breaker, right? So for fever, pain, and then inflammation. Um, and then the reason it's in here is because it's a blood thinner, right? So it has anticoagulation properties. And that's why um, we'll talk about it again in cardiology, but that's why it's recommended for a lot of adults to take low dose, or as I say in the lay public, baby aspirin. But um, stay away from baby aspirin. Some physicians frown upon that. I've got, you get may get some dirty looks on rotations if you say baby or aspirin. So low dose aspirin is you know, maybe a little more proper way to say it, and that is 81 milligrams. Um, don't worry about testing, I mean, doses for my tests, but it is something that's just good to know, practical knowledge. Um, so a low dose is, is recommended, 81 milligrams versus your 325 milligrams. Um, 
because it is cardioprotective, because it actually has some anticoagulation properties, and it quote unquote is a thins the blood, as they say in, in lay, lay public, or it's a blood thinner. Um, and there's been it's interesting just because there's been some there's you'll find some scientific articles out there that say is aspirin should aspirin be a, a vitamin or not? Is it essential? You know, is it since it's cardioprotective and has health benefits? Um, you know, is this something? To, well, and it turns out that we used to, as humans, eat a lot more of aspirin-like um, compounds. So salicylates are so aspirin is abbreviated ASA. So the abbreviation refers to acetyl salicylic acid, or ASA. And so aspirin is one of those that has you know two generic names if you want to think about it that way. For my testing purposes, I will only list the aspirin. Um, I will not only put acetyl acetyl salicylic acid or ASA, but just know you may see that out in practice. Um, and so it is a salicylate. So um, it's, and that's also part of its classification, um, its chemical structure. And so historically, humans ate a lot more of wild, wild growing plants. And um, wild growing plants are higher in salicylates than in your farm raised. And basically because the salicylates the plant produces help um, detract or help deter bugs, pests, um, etc. And so um, our ancestors in, in ingested a lot more of them. So that's kind of the current theory. Um, as to why this low dose aspirin is something that we need to supplement, you know, so to speak, or that we, you know, humans should take to, um, and then the other, the other interesting thing too is, and I'm sorry for getting off of, on a big tangent here. I just think this is interesting. The other thing too, is that there has been maybe a push to eat more wildly grown, um, fruits, vegetables, et cetera, because they have, um, higher concentrations of salicylates. Um, but all that food stuff is just interesting to me. So sorry for getting off on this on this tangent there. Um, but that's just a little bit of backstory. Um, but don't stress about that for, for exam purposes. So mechanism of action, a lot of stuff going on here. But COX is the take home point. C O X, COX one and COX two. Aspirin is a non-selective inhibitor of the COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. So cyclooxygenase is what we're talking about here. Um, definitely read through the slide and, and look at it. You can see why um, it has so many uses, right? Because it's hitting the COX-1 and COX-2. Um, and again, in the in, in, in NSAIDs lecture in musculoskeletal module, we will be revisiting this, digging into it a little bit more and more depth. Um, but, uh, but look at that. But take home point for mechanism of action, non-selective, inhibitor of COX-1 and COX-2. Um, it also does some other things too, and I again recommend you guys look at this. Um, take home point with low dose versus high dose. So, and this is for NSAIDs in general, with lower doses, um, they do not have their anti-inflammatory properties versus at higher doses. And again, we'll be re revisiting this. I'm going through it really quick, um, but take home point there. Um, so like things with ibuprofen is another NSAID we'll talk about. So the, you won't have your anti-inflammatory properties until you get to much higher doses, um, which usually you don't do with aspirin. You typically don't go really high with doses, and you, so you usually have the lower dose um, aspirin, which will inhibit platelet aggregation, you notice here, um, which again, why is then that's why it is cardioprotective, because it helps, um, it helps deter clot formation, right? Um, so anyway, so yeah, there is some there is some kind of method to the madness, so to speak, when dosing your NSAIDs. But um, that's kind of the, the summary take on point there. Uses. Um, look at this use. Um, just know that some of this primary secondary drug may be out of date. Um, definitely want to refer, refer to your guidelines um, when you're out in practice. But just read through this in general just to get a familiarity for it. But don't stress about memorizing this for my exam. Adverse effects. So definitely put a star by this GI adverse effects and bleeding, right? So um, you'll notice throughout this presentation, adverse effects, there's going to be bleeding, 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 right? So definitely want you guys to make that generalization as far as for these, all these medications in this, um, or not all of them, but the majority of these medications and start making connections and think about things that have bleeding as an adverse effect. Um, why am I saying that? It's not just to make you guys memorize unnecessary stuff. <laughs> um, I don't ever, again, I don't like torching you guys, right? Um, but the, it's good to know when drugs have an adverse effect of bleeding because so you can monitor your patient for it, first of all, and then second of all, 
for drug interaction. So if there, if a person is on multiple drugs that increase the risk of bleeding, then that is cumulative and it's kind of, it's additive in the sense that you have an increased risk of bleeding, right? So that's why I'm saying that. So make that generalization across the class of these drugs, but then also know about which ones it specifically hits. GI irritation is another one. So this is why um, aspirin is made with an enteric coating, which is what lay public will call a candy coating. It's not really a candy co <laughs> it's not really candy um it's not really candy coating it's 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 um you know chemically designed to put a coating on the aspirin so that it does, causes less GI irritation take home point the tinnitus or ring in the ears another uh, rare but serious one and then also respiratory alkal alkalosis um, followed by metabolic acidosis um, as part of signs and symptoms of toxicity so again rare but serious but but definitely pay attention to those so now we have the teclodipine and the clopidogrel. So for historical references, the teclodipine was put on here, so you can go ahead and cross that out. You don't have to stress about that. It's no longer available in the U.S. As of now, there are really bad problems with uh, toxicity, etc. So um, pull from the market. Clopidogrel is still on the market, and so definitely learn about that and pay attention to that. The, this is the generic for Plavix. Um, and again, mention the brand name just because, and you'll notice throughout this presentation, I have a lot of brand names. Um, and that's just because in my experience um, out in practice, you hear these being called by their brand names. Um, a lot of times they're easier to say, they're shorter, easier to remember. So Plavix is usually what people refer, refer to. Um, but note that it comes generic and you can order generic. And if you want to write a prescription, you can write it. So, and these are also platelet inhibitors, right? Remember, classification is important. Um, and they basically inhibit platelet aggregation and platelet to platelet interaction, so the stickiness of them, and to the hopefully reduce the formation of a clot or a thrombi or a, yeah, clot formation, right? Um, so, read through that, it's important stuff. Uses. Um, definitely read through those, be familiar with those. Um, just, in, I mean, in general terms, uh, cardiac uses, so recent particles myocardial infarction, recent stroke, um, peripheral artery disease, um, etc. Read through those. Adverse effects. We're starting here with um, rare but serious adverse effects, so read through those. Um, not as much of a concern with clopidogrel as the teclodipine, um, but again, that was pulled from the market, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, again, the TTP, another rare but serious, uh, read through that. Um, as far as its GI adverse effects, better than aspirin, so not as much. Um, but bleeding, you still need to go ahead and add that on the slide. You still need to be concerned about bleeding. Clopidogrel increases the risk of bleeding. Um, so again, it's something that you need to be thinking about with this. The other thing that is interesting or, or, or noteworthy is drug interaction. So clopidogrel is one of those medications that I want you guys to start making an instant connection. When you hear the drug, you think of drug inter interactions. Um, look at the list here. This isn't an all-inclusive. These are just some of the highlight, maybe a little more popular ones that you may come across. You notice that warfarin and phenytoin are on this list. Um, those are going to be on a lot of lists because those have a lot of drug interactions. So anytime you see warfarin, phenytoin, think drug interactions. Um, but then also, please now too, um, add that to the list, <laughs> the clopidogrel. Box warning for clopidogrel is here. It's an interesting, interesting one because it's related to pharmacogenomics. Um, so just read through it, um, know kind of the take home point that basically if a person has a um, a specific genotype or, you know, depending on their, their genetic makeup, that they may be a poor metabolizer. Um, so just so just look at that. And the pharmacogenomics is something that we don't spend a lot of time here in PA school with. Um, it's one of those things that um, we had a course in, in, in pharmacy school uh, for semester long. Um, and it's one of those things that they say is going to be more in the future. You're going to do genetic testing and then be able to prescribe things based on a person's genome um, or genotype rather, um, you know, to get the custom tailored drug and everything. Um, so I only bring it up when it's relevant or rather it's something important, like if it's related to a box warning. Um, but other than that, don't stress about pharmacogenomics too much for my course. Dipyridamol. So this is a antiplatelet agent. It's also a vasodilator. Read through the mechanism of action. It's pretty much sim it's sum it's summarized as much as possible. But take home points: um, antiplatelet, vasodilator. Uses. Um, here's some uses here. Just read through those. This is abciximab. 
kind of a tongue twister there. Brand name is Rio Pro, R E O P R O. So again, one that's usually easier to say the brand name. You hear a lot more about uh, about it. So this is also another antiplatelet agent. It's specifically a glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitor. So you um, pay attention to that or, or look at that because that is something that um, that is part of the classification that you will see people just refer to it as a as a um, glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitor. We have a couple others mentioned too, Intergalin and Agristat. Um, again, generic only on the on the brand on the exam. Um, but brand names are good for practice because I have not heard anyone ever refer to this other than just Agrostat. I think it's just so much easier to say and then remember and it, you can, I don't know. But anyway, so but testing purposes, definitely know the generic. Um, mechanism of action, read through that. Uses, um, I'll just go ahead and let you look, read through those. You know, it's going to depend on the patient, the setting, etc. But adverse effects, bleeding. So you notice the bleeding again. Um, Sorry to be repetitive, but I think the repetition helps. And um, again, it's something you want to be thinking about if you're prescribing these in combination with other medications that cause bleeding. Thrombocytopenia, uh, neither, another hematological concern, rare but serious. And there's different levels of thrombocytopenia that it can occur, but just know that it, it's just rare but serious. All right, here, um, visualization of mechanism of action of some of these medications. So if it helps you um, with aspirin inhib inhibit synthesis, et cetera, um, whatever helps here, but don't stress about memorizing these steps for my exam. Pletol. Silostazole. I don't know why I, I don't the pletol I say it kind of like an oaky like a southerner so I don't <laughs> pletol but yeah because it's what my majority of my experience of pletol is in Oklahoma so I say it like an oaky I'm sorry apologies my my oaky's coming out of oaky side's coming out of me so every once in a while there's some of these drug names I say like uh there's another one in pharmacy school that always make fun of me because the Depakote's a drug we'll talk about later with the uh, psych module. But I said Depakote, and they were like, where are you from? I'm like, hey, I'm from Texas. Come on. That's how we speak in the South. <laughs> but anyway, so it's not as annoyingly sounding as I just said it. But uh, but pleat pletal, I have to yeah, say it properly. So this one, um, again, depending on what textbook you look at in as far as classification, it's an antiplatelet agent. It's also a phosphodiesterase 3 enzyme inhibitor, so you may see that, you know, it's your type 3, phosphodiesterase 3, type 3 enzyme inhibitor, so you may see it classified as that, and then it's also can be classified as a vasodilator, so it, it, it antiplatelet and vasodilator, so you'll see how it's related to the uses there. Um, it does have a box warning, so it is contraindicated, and this is an absolute contraindication um, with heart failure of any severity. So please read through that and note that for this medication. Agrilin, another one, usually people refer to it by their brand name, but but, but, but generic. This is another antiplatelet agent that is also sometimes classified as a phosphodiesterase 3 enzyme inhibitor. Um, so just read through mechanism of action there. Um, and then we have a use there. Um, another use here, just read through it. And summary table. So again, like these, make sure you look at them. Um, I've had questions from students. So if an adverse effect is listed on the table, but not on the slide or vice versa, am I still responsible for it? Yes, please. Please, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so look at the tables, note those adverse effects. Look at the slides and note those adverse effects. Definitely check them, make sure you're not missing anything. Nothing's fallen through the cracks. Unfortunately, some students in the past have missed some test questions because they have seen, you know, They'll, they'll notice one adverse effect somewhere and one not on another. So for example, here, just glancing at this hypotension is listed for some of these. I did mention that these are vasodilators. So another generalization you can make with something that is a vasodilator or something that is an antihypertensive, which we'll talk about in the cardiology module, but something that lowers blood pressure is hypotension. So that's another one that you should be thinking about. And you'll notice these are kind of a two for two for one, right? Because they are, um, 
antiplatelet and vasodilator. So two adverse effects that should automatically jump into your mind when you hear antiplatelet, bleeding, and then if you hear vasodilation, hypotension. So um, again, and you'll notice that in cardiology too, I'll, you'll be, be kind of tired of me hearing saying um, at hypotension for adverse effect for antihypertensives. But um, again, I, part of the reason I'm doing is just so you have that kind of almost like a like a knee-jerk reaction, so to speak, or it's like, you know, a reflex. You hear, you know, so you start hearing these things and you're presented to them on rotations, et cetera. Um, because, you know, you guys probably have experience with it. Healthcare can be a very fast-paced, kind of stressful um, environment. And so it's not too bad as when you're students. Don't don't get scared of rotations yet. But <laughs> but this time next year, you know, you'll have to kind of pull some of these things. You'll hear, hear something that's antiplatelet. You'll want to be thinking about bleeding, right? And monitor your patient for bleeding. And then if putting them in combination with other things. Hypotension is another great one too. So please look at that because I, I don't think hypotension was maybe on the slides, but, um, you know, abcixamab, adverse effect, hypotension, bleeding, right? Again, even if it's not on the slides. Anticoagulants. So here are some anticoagulants that I definitely want you guys to pay attention to and, and know about. Um, and then the other thing too is that's probably maybe covered in pathophysiology or um, undergrad biology, or whatever. But I just remember my professors always talking about how um, the reason that we need anticoagulants is because historically it was very advantageous for our species to be able to co to coagulate to have clot formations um, because in ancient history, you know, ancient history, we were uh, the, the analogy was or the example was always that we were get attacked by tigers. I don't know. Uh, why they always use tigers, but um, so I just have to always, I think of anticoagulants or coagulation or whatever that I always think of being attacked by a tiger. So I have this mental association. But anyways, um, you know, and the, the idea was that you get attacked by a tiger. You're out in the bush or wherever wherever tigers are, um, not the city. No, and you, um, you it would it's advantageous for your ancestors to form a clot quickly, right? Because you want to stop bleeding so you don't bleed to death. Um, and hopefully you're able to get away from the tiger, et cetera, right? And not eaten to death too, because that's that'd be bad. But um, and so bec now in modern times, now we have to develop these anticoagulants, just basically because our bodies are very good at producing clots. So that's why they're important. Again, just fun facts, not on the test. Sorry for getting on my tangent again. First off, we have heparin, or the standard unfractionated heparin, or infractioned, I'm sorry, unfractioned heparin, UFH. Um, typically, people just refer to it as heparin. You may see the UFH um, written on something, or I've seen it on formularies, or, you know, you, you may see that sometimes. Um, but for my testing purposes, heparin is fine. And the other thing to notice too, so this is also a drug you'll see, and this is just FYI, you'll see heparin and you see open parentheses, unfractionated, and then, or yeah, and then closed parentheses. That's just the formulation. That's just how it comes. Um, don't stress about that. And for my test, I'll just put, I'll just say heparin. Um, mechanism of action there, notice that. You'll notice it's affecting some of those coagulation, that coagulation cascade, those um, clotting factors that we talked about earlier. So that's a good... Um, take home point, but it's basically, what does it do? It is an anticoagulant, right? So it prevents coagulation, it prevents clot formation. Um, so, you know, and a number of different things it does, but yeah, just, it's one of those where it's, it's hard to reduce to a quick, to a really small mechanism of action. So it is one of those you just have to kind of look through and just be familiar with, unfortunately. Uses, I mentioned it's an anticoagulant, so it's used as an for anticoagulation, right? So read through that. You'll see it a lot in a number of different settings, um, used a lot in hospitals. So um, get a lot of experience with that, probably on your rotations. Um, some more uses there. Go ahead and read through these. Um, I, I listed this here because I, this is a good source for guidelines. So specifically antithrombotic, but this is good also for other um, other things that are related to cardiology so that you'll hear, hear them referred to as the CHESS guidelines, but it's the American College of CHESS Physicians, ACCP. Um, definitely recommend, you know, as students, as new practitioners, as, you know, on rotations, when you get your new license, and you're holding on to it and you don't want to lose it, right? You don't want to get in trouble. Definitely go to guidelines. Um, there's some physicians and practitioners out there that are 
um, they scuffle or they look down on <laughs> scuffle is the first thing that came to my mind. They look down on guidelines and they'll, you'll hear it referred in a derogatory way. They'll say it's, this is cookbook medicine and, um, you know, you, you can't tell me what to do or whatever. Um, but you know, well, as a pharmacist, we like, we like cookbooks. Now, um, we like the guidelines and we rely heavily on them. So I was trained with guidelines and to follow guidelines. And, but I think in, you know, my wife's a physician too. I think definitely as a new practitioner when you're out learning um i mean she refers heavily on guidelines it's not it's not a bad thing but so um the just the main important thing is to know which guidelines to go to for which you know which thing you're you're looking at but so chest is great for this um so yeah again I'll get, I'll get off my tangent but so use guidelines uh, when you're on rotations and uh when you're a young or new practitioner and then it's good too even if you're a veteran you know what so i'm not i'm gonna get back on my soapbox if you're a veteran practitioner too um it's good to keep up to date but anyways okay enough of that sorry uh, uses here, read through them, again, probably out of date as far as the guidelines are concerned. So the latest chess guidelines um, may not have all of these the same, may have some the same. So this is just FYI table. Adverse effects, you're going to notice the bleeding there as again. So bleeding, 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 right? Um, look at that. So that's going to definitely be your most com or you know common adverse effect you need to be worried about. Um, hyperkalemia is another one that... Um, is something that can be more common and it's just something that you need to be aware of if you're going to be using heparin so it is it they do recommend to monitor for hyperkalemia when you are prescribing this or a person is using this medication you can read through the mechanism of action there but um and you know most hospitals will have that on their protocol it'll be something that um but definitely for testing purposes and for your boards and etc make sure um you're thinking about that thrombocytopenia the so-called hit so that's heparin induced H-I-T, uh, heparin-induced th th thrombocytopenia. Definitely put a star by that. Rare but serious. Um, it's on boards. You see it. Um, you see it on board review, you know, books, etc., or whatever. But um, but definitely look at that. It's Again, it may occur. Rare but serious. It is a very, you know, excuse me. Um, it is one of those that, you know, anytime it happens in the hospital or whatever, it's kind of newsworthy. You hear everybody talking about it. Um, and then so the and then the other thing to note, too, is that patients who develop HIT or HIT and people actually say HIT. It's not I'm not just messing around or whatever, but you'll you'll hear people say HIT. <laughs> um, the, so they the heparin induced thrombocytopedia. So patients who develop the HIT may um, also be at risk for developing a new thrombus. And then this is called heparin induced Thrombo, blah, blah, sorry, tongue twister. All right, take two. Right, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I edited. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. So it's hit with two T. So that's H I T T. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. Um, so that's one of those things that you need to be thinking about. If a person were to develop hit, then they are at a higher risk of developing hit with two T's, H-I-T-T, -T, right? So then you need to monitor platelets closely and you need to, um, so with heparin in general, monitor platelets closely and discontinue therapy and consider alternatives if the platelets are elevated and that means greater than 100,000 um, and or thrombosis develops. And um, the other thing to note too is that the HIT, the H, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna spell them out, I'm sorry. H-I-T HIT or H-I-T-T, hit with two T's may be delayed and can occur up to several weeks after you DC the heparin. Um, so again, it's something that um, is, you know, part of patient education, etc. Um, and then this is also you're supposed to use an extreme caution or for quote unquote limited duration um, if a patient has a history of hit. So that will be something you'll hopefully be noted on the chart and there'll be a, a good history there. And then especially if you're giving it within a hundred days of the last time they had HIT, right, HIT. Um, so anyways, so spend a little time on that, but again, because that's something, that's one of those, what they call high yield, um, something definitely to, to pay attention to for boards and for, and just being a good practitioner too, right? Now we have the low molecular weight heparins. So these, uh, you, you'll see them referred to as that, they'll, they'll say it all out, or they will see this sometimes abbreviated, see the, um, in the pharmacy or whatever, we see LMWHs. Um, I put the brand names again just because in my experience, people refer to them by their brand names a lot. Um, and so it's going to depend on where you work, which one's on the formula, which one they carry. Um, 
I've seen the Lovenox a lot as one that's pretty popular. Mexi uh, mechanism of action. Sorry, that hit stuff back there got me all tongue-tied. I'm like thrown off now, but uh, mechanism of action, 10A and 2A take on point, right? So it's an anticoagulant, but then these are the two factors that you need to be worried about. So if you look in a textbook or you look at other sources, the mechanism of action is, is, is giant. Um, there's a lot going on as far as if you want to really kind of know everything that's, that's going on. Um, but take home point, um, anti-factor 10A and then anti-factor 2A. And then there's a higher ratio of anti-factor 2A activity compared to anti to anti factor 2a so that's why i put mostly there um it just means that there's a ratio so the drug mainly you know works more on the on the 10a uses um read through all of these uh good stuff um note too that this can be used during pregnancy adverse effects so again you guys probably predicted this could already see it predict the future um bleeding right it's an anticoagulant you need to be thinking about that um, adverse reactions, I'm sorry, aller alert, I, allergic reactions, um, another one, uh, rare but serious, and it's just something, it's a hypersensitivity that sometimes people can have um, allergic reactions with it. Another thing, too, that's related to um, a box warning um, for the low molecular weight heparins, um, and you can go ahead and just add it wherever, but um, is that there is a, uh, a box warning for spinal slash epidural hematomas. Um, so those may occur in patients who are anticoagulated with these low molecular weight heparins um, and are receiving neuraxal anesthesia or undergoing spinal puncture. Um, so in these hematomas unfortunately can result in long-term permanent paralysis. Um, so anyways, it's one of those just kind of niche uses and that basically is just a way the benefits versus the risk of, of having a neuraxial intervention in patients that are, are anticoagulated or will need to be anticoagulated with these low molecular weight heparins. So um, just note, note that. It's kind of a special, unique sort of thing. Um, usually box warnings aren't that specific, but just note that that is one that's on that. Arixtra. So this one, I'm not even going to try the generic name. I always miss it, mess it up. It feels like a French name to me, but... Um, so again, this is another one. Know the generic for testing purposes, but um, usually people refer to this one by the brand name. So this is another anticoagulant. Um, it's also a factor 10A inhibitor. Um, so you may see it labeled as such. Um, just FYI, you can do once a day dosing because of this longer half-life. Some uses there, PE, DVT. Now we have the direct thrombin inhibitors. Um, and I know I broke them down by IV and MPO. Don't stress too much about memorizing that for my exam, but that definitely will come into play um, when you are um, out in practice because usually it's easier to give PO medications or by mouth medications um, when you're sending patients home or whatever out of the hospital. Again, put brand names there just because that's what usually people note, note them by or refer to them as. Please put a star here by the antidote. I want to make sure you guys know all antidotes. So I also think this helps to... So I don't know if I cut out or not. So I just said that please know the antidote. I don't know if I'm repeating myself. My computer froze for a little bit. So know the antidote for Dabigatran or Pradax as a brand name. Uh, make sure you note that. Um, good news as far as classification goes for, and mechanism of action. The classification, the direct thrombin inhibitors or DTIs, um, is the mechanism of action size the take-home point for that. Um, and then it's this is used for, I mentioned the hit earlier, the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. This can be used then safely for patients who have had uh, have clot formations or have the HITT. Direct factor 10 inhibitors, again, helps with mechanism of action because this is what they do. This is how it's classified, right? So it's kind of easier for studying. Um, X ban, I put that there just because they all have that in common. You see with the spelling, um, river rocks, river, <laughs> this is another one. Sorry. So there was a, there was a, a physician, a cardiologist up in Oklahoma that would say, and I didn't know what he was talking to me. He's asking me if we had river rocks, a ban. 
and I, I thought he was saying like river rock like river rocks a band like like rocks that are found in a river and then i was like a band of i was yeah, anyways but yeah Zarelto. i understood what he said what he said to, so uh river rocks a band and then now ever since then since i made fun of him in the pharmacy for like the rest of the week um to the other people i worked with of course behind his back right now um and he's a really nice guy he's super smart too but he just had a really thick southern accent and some of the times he'd say drugs on the phone and i was like i don't know what that drug is sir um but yeah Zarelto, a pixaban and then a doxaban so you'll notice they all end in the x a b a n again brand names there just because that's what you hear a lot and these are newer ones too so that's also a trend too when a drug comes out when it's newer people typically just refer to it by its brand name mechanism of action take home point it inhibits 10a right so that's good and that's both intrinsic and extrinsic intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation pathways um you notice here too that there aren't antidotes which is one of the concerns and maybe something that you'll see as future practitioners is this going to be something that's going to affect prescribing long term that there isn't a way to reverse this and you'll notice it is hitting both of the intrinsic and just kind of food for thought uh, don't stress about that too much but um, it'll be interesting to see what, when you all are practitioners um if it's something that you know will will kind of affect affect the way you you practice use read through all of those and they'll make sense if you think about things that you'd want anticoagulation for adverse effects again make sense hopefully you guys could see this slide coming a mile away um major bleeding luckily is low and uh, is similar or lower than other anticoagulants um, but there still is the risk for life-threatening hemorrhages. And the reason I note that and kind of just read the slide to you guys, I normally don't do that, is again, because of that, there is no antidote. Um, and when they first, first came out, they were the bee's knees, right? They were the coolest thing since sliced bread, as far as like no risk of bleeding. But, and then it started, as they came out, more research was done, you know, post-market surveillance, et cetera, life-threatening hemorrhages still can occur. So don't you, you may hear drug reps, you may hear things saying that, oh, major bleeding is low or it's lower than other anticoagulants, but still remember the back of your head that, you know, bleeding is a concern, right? Because we're talking about anticoagulants, this whole freaking presentation, that's all I'm talking about. And then life-threatening ones are still a concern, even with these newer, um, newer medications. Box warnings. So this is something, again, I want you guys to note, like with all box warnings, but um, this one's kind of interesting too. So premature discontinuation increases the risk of thrombotic events. So this is one where compliance comes into play. So my grandma was actually on this and she's notorious for not taking medications when she's supposed to. She's the one, she's like takes some thyroid medication, leave it throughout. And she'll, she'll just be like, oh, I didn't feel like taking it today. You know, one of those patients are like, oh, I felt like I needed a drug holiday. Um, so this was one where I sat her down and, and she has a, one of my aunts lives with her and helps take care of her now. But it was like, definitely do not let grandma just stop taking this if she doesn't want to, because she's had stroke, had a stroke in the past and had some TA, some other things. But so she needs to be anticoagulated. Right, the cardiologist put her on this for a reason, and again, you can actually do damage if you DC it early. Um, so, so anyways, just just note that. Another one to um, spinal epidural hematomas. You'll notice that that was the same thing with the low molecular weight um, heparins. But go ahead and read through that here. Same thing, same same type of same box warning. Warfarin. So this is the generic. Uh, I put the brand name Coumadin. Um, this is another one that because working, I worked in a Coumadin clinic up in Oklahoma for a few years um, with the Chickasaw Nation. Um, and so we had patients and then we had this one lady that would say Coumadin. And so again, that was something that I thought was hilarious. And I would, me and the nurses and all, we'd joke around about Coumadin, Coumadin. Well, then I've given presentations now, or there's times when I'm trying to be serious and professional with students or whomever or patients and I say kudamin and they look at me like what do you say so it just it just goes to show hey don't make fun of your patients too much in the way they say they how they talk funny or whatever but warfarin it is kumadin all right it's not kudamin um but anyways just FYI as far as it's a synthetic derivative um originally it can fun fact it was originally rat poison I don't know if you guys knew that but um mechanism of action so this is a lot of lots going on here um, it's important enough for me to put it all on the slide, so please look at it all. Um, if, if you guys have noticed by now, I don't try to just overload the slides and put a ton of stuff. I try to keep it to what's important. Um, so look at it, 
read through it. Um, take home point though is it it's it affects the vitamin K dependent factors, right? So and what are those? That is factor two, seven, nine, ten, and C and S, right? So those are the ones that you just unfortunately just have to memorize. Just look at those, um, squint at that, so to speak. Um, and again, you'll see that on your boards later on. It's one of those things that I feel like is not that great because you um, don't really necessarily have to see it out in practice or think about it. But, you know, for testing purposes and for your boards, um, go ahead and learn that. So take on point with mechanism of action. Um, inhibits those vitamin K dependent factors. So what are those? 2, 7, 9, 10, C, and S. And then as far as its effect, it is very good at anticoagulation. That's actually part of the reason that it was um, rat poison. It just basically causes the, the rodents and stuff to bleed to death because um, it's really good at preventing clot formation. Here's just a... Um, so here's just a visual representation of what warfarin's doing. So basically, warfarin is disrupting the clotting factor clotting factors that require vitamin K. So another way to say it is that warfarin um, depletes functional vitamin K reserves and then therefore reduces synthesis of active clotting factors. So you get a reduction in those vitamin K dependent clotting factors that were listed before. Um, this slide is just FYI for my testing purposes. We just know that there is some generic um, generic genetic factors that can come into play and some generic genetic variability uh, uses again just look through that just FYI adverse effects bleeding right um, and like I mentioned before it's warfarin's a very good anticoagulant so there is bleeding risk all over the place so hemorrhage at any site it's actually there is a box warning let me see yeah I put the box warning there there's actually a block box warning for bleeding wrist you can see the next slide for that um, but virtually any slot site um, so this is something where they student I mean patients must be instructed um, that if they have any signs or symptoms of bleeding bruise unusual bruising etc um, they need to notify their healthcare practitioner. And the other thing, too, is if they have any signs or symptoms of a clot formation, so shortness of breath, maybe for a pulmonary embolism or whatever, because maybe they're not being anticoagulated enough. And then there's a ton, a ton of drug interactions and food interactions. Um, so it's something that, and it's also there's uh, changes in smoking can affect um, the, the warfarin levels. Um, so it's, again, takes a lot of patient education, et cetera. Um, and it's hard for people to be consistent, but so they need to be as consistent as they can with their drugs they take and with the med the foods they eat, etc. Um, read through that, but just read, I mean, read through that. That's important stuff. Um, as far as monitoring, this is just more of an FYI slide, but just know it is the um, the INR that is that is used to so use PT as well, but INR is the International Normalized Ratio, um, which is, don't stress too much about the history of that or whatever, I won't get into that right now, um, but that the INR is typically going to be set by the cardiologist or um, this was at least my experience. Um, and so it basically depends on the indication and depends on the patient where that INR goal is. And then you dose it accordingly to try to target the INR. Um, so, and I have another, another slide on dosing. Again, this is just FYI. Um, just know that again, with generic variation, et cetera, um, usually kind of most average adults, you'll start on five milligrams and that you go that once a day and then um, you'll go from there as far as is either increasing your dose or lowering your dose, depending on the INR readings and how close you are, you know, to the INR, the, the, the INR that is your goal. So I just pulled this up. The dosing thing reminded me. I didn't include an image, but I think it's good to, um, again, don't stress about memorizing this for testing purposes, but it is good for your knowledge um, to know that they do come in some different, they do come in different colors depending on the strengths. And so these are the different strengths. It's 1, 2, 2.5, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7.5, and 10. So you can play around a lot with the, with the dosing 
dosaging and stuff of, of that and, and really kind of custom tailor it. Um, but typically you start with five. Um, and the reason that it's good, so generic or brand name, they come in this color and they are standardized. So this is good So because a lot of times patients get their doses mixed up, uh, especially if they're older, et cetera, whatever. Um, so it's been my experience that it's good to ask them which color they are because then you can then you know which so if they're not sure what dose they're taking or whatever if they don't have their tablets with them or their pill bottles or if what they do is like with a lot of patients they mix up all their tablets in one pill bottle um because what happens is from the pharmacy will maybe give you know monday wednesday thursday take four milligrams and then the rest of the week take six milligrams or take two milli whatever it is we'll give them a couple different bottles or three different bottles they, they try not to give give a patient too many different strengths um, because it can get confusing for them or whatever. Um, but again, that's just, just FYI. I don't stress about memorizing this. I just did a quick Google search um, for the Warfarin tablets, and it just pulled up this. So there's a lot of different examples there, but you can, um, you know, look at those if you want. It may help on rotations. So, yeah, this tablet colors just FYI. Oh, the other thing, too, that's just interesting for historical perspective, perspective, but not on the test, is that the Warfarin's, the name's actually um, derived from, so it's W-A-R-F, which is the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. Um, that, so it was originally discovered in Wisconsin. And then the A-R-I-N, or A-R-I-N, is because it's a Coumarin, so Warfarin. Anyways, it's just FYI. It's like it'll be like on Jeopardy or something. You guys can get or trivia night when you play board games with your friends. Um, comparison here, just look through this. Just FYI, um, don't stress about that. I like the antidote though. I mean, definitely pay attention to the antidote and safety and pregnancy. Star both of those. Those are those are good stuff. Contraindications. So I just mentioned pregnancy, but so definitely put a star by that. Want to make sure you guys know that it should be avoided in pregnant women and that's an absolute contraindication and then bleeding disorders are also contraindications again hopefully pretty uh, self-explanatory there drug interactions many put like six six uh, stars and six um, exclamation points there tons and tons of drug interactions um, anytime you see warfarin just assume there's a drug interaction just look at it just look it up just think that's going to have some effect on on the uh, the patient as far as their you know increase or decrease INR. Um, I like this table from up to date. Just look through it. Don't stress too much about it. Um, but just you know, list of some that may increase INR, some that may decrease INR. So it's going to depend on what the patient's on or what they're taking. If they have other comorbid conditions, if they need to be on other therapies long term, um, if they get TB, you know, rifampin's on there. Shout out to rifampin. Um, you know, if they're on antibiotics, etc. Here's another list too. Again, just read through it and again, take on point is that there's a ton, a ton to always be worried with. Good summary chart here. I'm going to look through this. Um, adverse effects. The, another one I'd I'd add to is um, as a rare but serious one for warfarin specifically is skin necrosis or gangrene. Um, so this is where you. Um, You've maybe heard of a purple toe syndrome with with um, with warfarin. So um, so it can't again rare but serious. They can cause skin necrosis or gangrene um, and or other tissues. Again, very rare. But this is due to paradoxical local thrombuses. Um, onset is usually within the first few days of therapy and is frequently localized to limbs, breast, penis. And the, uh, the risk of this effect is increased in patients with protein C or S deficiencies. Um, so again, rare but serious. One of those that sometimes pops up on board reviews or whatever. Um, and then also related to the purple toe. So that skin necrosis or gangrene can kind of maybe look that way. But then specifically the purple toe syndrome is related to cholesterol microemboli. So um, the warfarin may actually release erythematous plaque emboli and so symptoms depend will depend on the site of the embolization um, it's most commonly kidneys pancreas liver and spleen and again this is a rare but serious adverse effect um, and then in some cases it may lead to necrosis or death so this is where you get this co-called purple toe syndrome um, and it's due to the cholesterol microembolization so this typically occurs several weeks after therapy and may present as a dark purplish 
model discoloration on the plantar and lateral surfaces of the feet. So I just wanted to note that just, you can put here purple toe syndrome um, as an adverse effect. Again, rare, rare but, but serious. And again, just something that I feel like pops up, but you'll see that every once in a while. So I don't want you guys to miss that in the future. All right, fibrinolytic drugs. He's basically lytic or lysis means to cut up. So they cut up the fibrin, right? So these are also known as clot busters. So thrombo thrombolytics, thrombo thrombo uh, fibrinolytics, thrombolytics, getting tongue tied here, getting a little bit tired, um, aka. So those are just other ways to interchange them. Um, I will be referring them primarily as fibrinolytics for testing purposes, um, but then also clot busters is what you may hear them. Here's just a overview visual representation of where they are working. Uses again, I've already mentioned this table, just look through that. Um, here are their uses here, can be help, can be beneficial with an MI or stroke, but again, there's a, a small window for that. Contraindication to these thrombolytic therapies, read through those. Antidotes, so definitely no note those, know the antidotes, memorize those. And here are some drugs, again, Brand names are just listed for FY purposes. Mechanism of action. So basically, they're fibrinolytic because they, they help the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. Uses. Um, go ahead and read through those. Again, going through these quickly, just so hitting, trying to hit the highlights here. Eurokinase. Another one. I'm just going to read through that streptokinase. This is no longer this is historical reference. It's been discontinued. Um, read through this adverse effect contraindications. Good stuff. Metastatic drug and drug products. Vitamin K. So um, definitely read about this. We talked about it with um, with Warfarin. Brand name there is just FYI. Uses here. Um, definitely make sure you know the uses of that. Um, notice too that it's, it does help reverse the effect of warfarin, so please note that. Um, but then you also will need fresh frozen plasma or FFP, so you will be seeing that be, been, being given in patients. So it's FFP plus the vitamin K. Adverse effects, read through that. Protamine sulfates, again, please note it, it is the antidote for heparin overdose. Amicar, read through this as well. Um, Desmopressin, this one's interesting. Definitely read through it. Make sure you know all the different uses. Um, this is one we'll see in some other modules will pop up again. Um, you notice it's used for diabetes insipidus and nocturnal enuresis. Um, but then here, because of the uh, hemophilia, it's in this presentation. So read through all of those. Blood product derivatives, um, read through these and just be familiar with those. Again, don't worry about the... Oh, those aren't brandy. I'm sorry. These are human derived. Also here, just read through this. Um, this one was removed from the market, so that's just there for historical purposes. Also, just read through these. And that is it. So that was my quick overview. Again, please pay attention to everything that's in these slides. Um, you know, they all are fair game for testing purposes, but I wanted to go through and just kind of highlight some things and make sure that certain things were um, noted for you guys. So hopefully this helps. Feel free to email me as always. If you have any questions, I will talk to you guys later.